Hi, Sarah. Hi, Allison. So um, we've been hearing a lot of this lately. So these are protesters banging on pots and pans. It's become known as the casserolade, casserole being the word for pot in French. And, and it started about two weeks ago when some people wanted to drown out a speech that President Emmanuel Macron gave right after signing the pension reform into law. Yeah, and it's since grown into a bit of a thing here mm-hmm. with people clanging kitchenware to, to drown Macron out whenever he or his ministers venture out to meet members of the public. Yeah, which they're trying to do a bit more of to win back some public support after this whole thing, a very unpopular reform. Mm. Now, the casserolade is actually an old tradition. It goes back to the Middle Ages. Um, it was called the charivari, and the idea was to shame people who did wrong or went against the community norms. As a form of political protest, people were banging pots in the early 19th century during the reign of King Louis-Philippe I when Republicans objected to their bourgeois rulers. Uh, more recently, in reaction to all these protests, local authorities in some areas have invoked the penal code to ban the pot bashing as portable sound devices. <laughs> Very technical. My goodness, yeah. Portable. <laughs> um, uh, this was, of course, ridiculed, and it's just served to encourage more people to, to take out their pots and pans. Um, several ministers have been greeted by uh, saucepan symphonies in recent days. Yeah, Macron tried to diffuse the situation. He said hitting saucepans would not take France forward. Then, of course, the French saucepan manufacturer Christelle had to weigh in. Monsieur le Président, the company said, we make pans that do take France forward. Saucepan companies, of course, getting their spotlight in all of this. Um, the whole situation is is a very literal demonstration of two sides not listening to one another at all. Protesters in the government, opposition parties in the government, or unions in the government. And there was some pop banging on Monday's May Day rally, Sarah, mm-hmm. along with the usual chanting and, uh, alas, violence between some protesters and the police. More than 400 police officers were injured and 291 people were arrested across the country. Yeah, turnout for these marches was much bigger than in past years. Uh, people are keen to show that they continue to oppose the pension overhaul. <laughs> And Sarah, the other thing that was unusual about this year's May Day marches, so, you know, for workers' rights, etc., was the fact that unions, all eight of France's federations, marched together mm-hmm. in what's known as the Intersyndicale, or the inter-union group, that formed around opposition to pension reform. The two biggest unions in France, the hardline leftist CGT and the reformist CFDT, don't usually agree on very much, uh, but they have been marching together on all the recent anti-pension reform protests, and last Monday's march was no exception. This was an exceptional May the 1st. We haven't had such a May the 1st in France for the last 30 years, says Sophie Binet, the CGT's new leader. Our message is that we don't want this pension reform. There will be no return to normal, she says, so long as it isn't withdrawn. We want to put French people's real concerns on the agenda. Salary increases, reducing the working week, improving working conditions, gender equality and the environment. Binet is gung-ho, it has to be said, because after years of falling membership, the CGT has seen a 30% increase since the protests began in January. The CFDT has also seen a bigger than usual increase in its membership. This would suggest that the unions are maybe the winners so far in all of this upheaval. And yet union membership in France, Sarah, remains among the lowest in Western Europe. If you look at the numbers of how many French people are part of a union, you may be very surprised because there's only 8%, uh, 5% if you look at the private sector. So this is very few compared to other countries. But I think what's important to understand is that being a union member in France means that you are really mobilized. That's Marie Ménard. She's a French researcher on trade unions. I talked to her about what defines the French trade union movement and this French paradox, whereby you have low membership, but unions continue to punch above their weight. In France, the weight of unions doesn't depend on how many members they have, but it depends on how well they do on professional elections. So meaning that 
if you're working in this company, every four years, the employers have to organize elections. And so workers, whether they are union members or not, they can vote for these unions. And so once the union get more than 10%, for instance, they can be representative of workers. Mm -hmm. And so this has a very big impact because it means that it doesn't matter you know, how many people are part of the union, what matters is how well the unions are doing at these elections. So you have this representation at the level of the company, and then you have at every branch, so company, branch, and then the last level will be a national representation. So you have unions sitting at each of these levels. And I think what's interesting is that, you know, there's only 8% of uh, union members, and you know, it's only, I think, roughly 600,000 for the CGT, of members nationally. So the CGT is the historic union. And I think it's interesting because the CGT has been crucial in defining what French trade unionism is. Um, this one very big event, if we're thinking about the history of unions in uh, France, it's the Charter of Amiens in 1906. And this is a moment where the CGT members voted on the independence of trade unions from electoral politics. So it means that unions are not affiliated to any political party. But the second thing, which I think is crucial to understand trade unions in France, is that during this convention, the CGT decided that the best mean to struggle, okay, to fight the employer, would be the strike. So they said striking, and especially organizing general strike, is the way employees are going to be heard. So it is a very uh, specific system and which maybe goes to explain something we call the French paradox, which is mm -hmm. that despite the low union membership, the unions pack a heavy punch, as we've recently seen with the pension reform protests. Yeah, there are actually not a lot of people who've been on strike since the beginning of the pension reform protests. But if you look at the rallies organized by the unions, uh, you had millions of people in the street. And all that thanks to the unions who were organizing this protest. So what it means is that they managed to organize beyond their union membership. So is this also because they are very powerful in certain sectors? Yes, for sure. A couple of sectors are, of course, crucial in blocking the economy. So you think of electricity, okay, energy sector, railroad workers, refuse collection. These are very important to hold for the unions because once they go on strike, this is very visible. I mean, Paris was terrible two months ago, okay? just piles of trash everywhere. And I think something interesting too is that the CGT has also managed to keep a very positive image among the public opinion, which has not been the case all the time. Sometimes the CGT has been criticized for being you know, too radical or too confrontational. But this time, I think they really played on a specific strategy to keep a good image. What I'm saying is uh, the CGT cut electricity when, for instance, Macron or some of his you know, people from the government were visiting a building. Uh, but they also decided to give electricity for free to some hospitals and to some public schools. So you kind of have this Robin Hood kind of image, which yeah. I think is very it's, clever. Sure, yeah. it's totally illegal. <laughs> yeah, it's totally illegal, but, you know, for the French public, you know, for the French audience, people thought it was a nice gesture, uh, which meant that the CGT was not only the selfish organization that has been, you know, criticized to be, but it also could be a bit more working for the common good, if you mm. will. So overall, how has the pension reform protest sort of impacted the French trade union movement? I think the main thing that happened during this protest was the intersyndicale. So the coalition of all the federations, the eight federations, uh, they make up trade unionism in France. And among this intersyndicale, you find very reformist unions like the CFDT, but you also find more radical ones like CGT or Solidaire. And I think seeing these people working together because they were opposed to this reform really was the key element that improved their image. Because in the past, you know, there has been a lot of tensions. What usually happened in previous reforms was that the CFDT would negotiate with the government at some point. So the government was aware that this reformist union was ready to negotiate, okay, and maybe being less radical than the others. So the government will negotiate with the CFDT, which would halt the intersyndicale. And this time, the government decided not to. So the intersyndicale remained unspoiled. The federations kept fighting together. Despite the fact that they came together with one voice... The trade union movement in France, the inter as you say, did not succeed 
in stopping the pension reform. What does that tell us about the state the unions are in and the power that they have? Um, a lot of uh, union members were you know, frustrated at their unions because they didn't call for a grève générale, general strike, so stoppage of every sector of activities. Uh, but as you mentioned, unions are very important in some sectors of activity in France and in some, like service, uh, you know, especially new forms of work, they are not. So they could not organize a general strike because you know only eight percent of people are union members, and I think this showed the limit. Yes, they can have a huge impact, but they still don't have the organizing capacity at the local level to win the fight against the reform and against a government that, in any case, had decided it would appear not to negotiate with the unions. Yes, exactly. The government did not sit at the bargaining table at any time. Do you think that the current government, with uh, Emmanuel Macron at the helm, wants to break the power of the unions? Has that been part of the strategy? In some extent, because, you know, in our constitution, it's written that unions are legitimate in matters of work and, you know, working conditions and everything. And I think the decision of Macron not to sit at the bargaining table with the unions before last week has been seen as, you know, a union busting tactic by many. And it is pretty unprecedented to have the government do that kind of thing. And the challenge for the unions when they are, you know, denied their role in the social democracy is what kind of actions do they go for and how do they remain legitimate So, Sarah, we're coming up to the anniversary of Miss France. Mm, the famous or infamous uh, beauty competition. Yeah, the first one was held 103 years ago on the 10th of May, 1920. Ah, so a year before Miss America. What kicked off the French competition? It was the brainchild of a Belgian writer and journalist, Maurice de Vallef, and the French daily Le Journal. At the time, it was called La Plus Belle Femme de France, France's most beautiful woman. Mm, so the emphasis clearly on the physical aspects of mm. things. Oh, yes. <laughs> but what's interesting, maybe, is the way that Wallef organised the voting, because the jury was made up of painters, sculptors, photographers, novelists and other artists, and their job was to select 49 finalists out of the 2,000 or so candidates who'd sent their pictures in to the paper. Those 49 were then divided into groups of seven and they were given the names of flowers, precious stones or birds. And then it was up to film goers to choose their favourite pin-up. Like film goers, like people going to the movies? Yeah, ah. yeah. Basically, over the course of seven weeks, when people went to the cinema, they were given a card with the photos of the seven candidates for that week, along with a bit of information, the women's eye colour, hair, skin and, of course, their height. Uh, portraits of the women were also shown on the big screen. And then the audience wrote down their order of preference and sent their postcard in to the daily paper, Le Journal. So who won that first edition in 1920? A 17-year-old girl called Agnès Souret. She was from Bayonne in the French Basque country. She had pale skin, long brown, wavy pre-Raphaelite curls, big brown eyes, a curvy figure. She measured 1 metre 68. She'd been given the name The Emerald. Mm. And she literally swept the ball with close to 115,000 votes. That's twice the number of the girl who came second. Press reports at the time referred to her dazzling beauty but also cheerful nature. Hmm. So how did she end up entering the competition in the first place? Well, she was from very humble beginnings. She was the illegitimate daughter of a dancer, but she dreamt of becoming an actress. Ah, and so did becoming France's most beautiful woman help her with that? It did. Ah. Very shortly after, she got her first role in the film Le Lys du Mont Saint-Michel. It was a critical success, apparently. It was the first of three films she starred in. She worked also as a model and a dancer at the opera in Monte Carlo. She appeared in reviews at the Folie Bergère in Paris. Some people said she was destined for great things, others that she lacked sophistication. We'll never know because her career was short-lived. She caught peritonitis when she was on tour in Argentina and she died in 19. 
1928. She was only 26. Hmm, a sad end. But uh, Miss France, the show continued. It's changed a lot. Yeah, it was rebranded. In fact, it took on the name of Miss France ah. in 1927 after just one other edition. It then stopped during the Second World War and picked up again in 1947. But it wasn't until 1986 that the competition made its way onto TV. It was broadcast live and it was an absolute fiasco. Miss Alsace, Miss France, 87. For the first time, viewers were invited to vote. They had to call in a partner radio station, but it was all a complete mess. The host got very mixed up. Attendez, parce que là, on, a, on risque de faire une petite erreur. Attendez, attendez. Où est-ce que j'en suis it took 10 minutes to establish exactly who had won. Oh, wow. the, the, yeah, the sort of finalists were all on stage. Complete confusion. The winner, 19-year-old Nathalie Marquet, was booed on stage. Wow. OK. So voting today is smoother. I guess mm. there's one candidate for each of France's 100 departments. Um, but there's still been scandals. Yeah, like in 2007, when a suggestive photo of Valérie Begg was published just a few days after she was crowned Miss France. Uh, the competition forbids any form of uh, nude or semi-nude photography. In the end, she didn't lose her title, but she was banned from entering Miss Universe and Miss World. Catastrophe. Mm. Um, then in 2020, Miss Guadeloupe was disqualified from entering the Miss France competition because of topless charity photos that she'd uh, taken part in. But, I mean, it was for a, a breast cancer awareness campaign. Oh, oh. right. So, like, a good yeah, cause, com- in theory. Complicated. Yeah. Anyway, these competitions kind of feel a bit out of date. We would tend to think so. And until recently, the criteria for entering was unbelievably restrictive. It was only women aged 18 to 24. They had to be single, no kids, no visible tattoos or body piercing, no plastic surgery, no history of any kind of nude photography. And the minimum height was 1 metre 70. Wow, that's tall and quite strict, all these things. Um, Organisers now say, though, that they promote all women after pressure from feminist groups. Yeah, in 2021, the group Osez le Feminisme took the competition to court, arguing it was sexist, that the selection process was discriminatory because of this minimum height thing, and that it broke French labour laws because it imposed restrictions on candidates, such as no smoking in public, even outside of rehearsals or recordings. In January, this year, a court rejected the accusation of discrimination, but it did recognise that there was a job involved and a recruitment process that had to be respected. Mm, French labour law. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, the contest has been modernised a bit, so now it allows any woman over 18 years of age, of any height, to enter. Visible tattoos are, were allowed for the first time last year, and transgender women who have female civil status are also now allowed to compete. Usé le féminisme nonetheless called the changes white paint over a mouldy wall. Ooh, that's yeah. a that's an image. <laughs> it is. <yeah. laughs> so so what is being elected Miss France actually bring you in the end of all this? Uh, 100,000 euros in oh. gifts and sponsorship deals. Not, not bad. Not bad yeah. A monthly salary of 5,000 euros for the year, plus a free flat in Paris. Yeah, OK, not bad mm. for a year if you like that kind of thing. Yeah, they certainly keep you busy, though. Mm. Uh, but there seems to be no shortage of candidates or audiences, apparently. More than 7 million people tuned in to the 2022 edition. Right, Alison, name this tune. I know this. It's the theme music to the Tintin cartoon series. Uh, we have the box set, Sarah, in English at home. Ah, okay. Mm. Well, Tintin was the brainchild of Belgian cartoonist Georges Rémy, who wrote and drew under the pen name Hergé. He died 40 years ago today, but Tintin is still very much alive. So Tintin is a young Belgian reporter. He goes on adventures all around the world with his dog Milou, mm-hmm. or Snowy, as he's called in English. Yeah, yeah. Um, Tintin has a, a distinctive lock of hair sticking up up on his forehead. He's often joined by a supporting cast of characters like the grumpy Captain Haddock, the slightly deaf Professeur Tournesol, or Professor Calculus in English, and the incompetent detectives Thompson and Thompson. In French, it's Dupont and Dupont. 
The comic books, or bidets, are staples in many French households. 24 albums in a row on a shelf in many houses. The first was published in 1930, a serialized comic strip in Le Petit Vingtième, the youth supplement of the conservative Catholic Belgian newspaper Le Vingtième. Hergé was the editor. Today, nearly 100 years later, they still sell quite well. The publisher says about half a million copies are sold each year in France. Over 250 million copies have sold around the world. They've been translated into a bunch of languages. I went to talk to comic book sellers about Tintin. First, I stopped into Album, a shop on a street in Paris's Latin Quarter that's lined with comic book shops. So this is the Tintin Corner. Yes. This is Sophie, a saleswoman, showing a bookshelf with several rows of Tintin books. So what do you have? Like You have all of the series. Yes. Uh, we have a lot of uh, edition for Tintin. In color and black and white. The shop sells lots of other comic books. Tintin, she says, mostly attracts adults who are buying the books for their kids or grandkids. We have a lot of people come here just for uh, buy something for their little child. The grandchildren? Uh, yes. For, this is a very uh, transmission. So you're saying a lot of it is like sharing it with your younger, the younger generation? Yes. <laughs> Sophie and her colleagues sort through boxes of keychains with figurines of comic book characters. There's Tintin and Snowy. The shop is actually full of Tintin merchandise, posters, postcards. Figurine, mugs, t-shirts. The store makes 60% of its sales with this merchandise, which subsidizes the comics, Tintin and others. Les albums traditionnels. Ludo, who runs another comic book shop farther north in Paris, shows his Tintin shelf. Ensuite, un autre rayon qui comprend les facsimilés, c'est-à-dire des copies des albums. He's a die-hard Tintin fan and collector, but the books take up only three small shelves in his store, which is otherwise packed with other comics and mangas. Tintin sells regularly, but it's not what keeps his store alive. C'est des albums qui très tôt sont entrés dans les foyers, qui étaient euh, bien vus. Euh, These were books that were embraced by families, he explains. They were considered good books with positive characters, not too much violence, with a Boy Scout spirit. Today, they're handed down from generation to generation. He says his clients are often looking to complete their collection because they've lost a book or they're damaged, so they're introducing them to their kids. But there are issues with Tintin, aren't there, Sarah? Mm. Some of the drawings are anti-Semitic. There's a real lack of female characters, mm -hmm. aside from Bianca Castafiore, but she's not a, a very strong yeah. uh, character. And then there are the racist stereotypes in Tintin in the Congo, for example. Exactly. That was the second story he wrote in 1931, when Belgium was colonizing the Congo. Definitely stereotypical depictions of the Congolese, drawn with big lips and no hair. There's a witch doctor in there. Um, Um, Tintin is the white savior. Tintin in the Congo is often presented as rather colonialist or even racist. And I think that even if the criticism is justified, the book needs to be put into context. That's Renaud Natier, who's the author of Faut-il brûler Tintin? Should we burn Tintin? One of several books he's written about Tintin and Hergé. He's a big fan. I think it can actually be useful when you're reading Tintin in the Congo to little kids or school children to give a kind of introduction to explain the context of Belgium's colonization of Congo at the time. Natier says a lot of the criticism of Tintin is very much justified. And yet, Tintin remains immensely popular, both the books themselves and as a subject. He says about 600 books have been written about Tintin and Hergé, which is huge. The question I've asked myself is why, despite everything, we're still a bit fascinated by Tintin, even in the 21st century, and why so many people continue to be a bit fascinated by these Tintin books. Yes, there's nostalgia, he says. That explains some of it, but it doesn't explain it all. Natia says there's something universal about Tintin. He's an everyman who travels the world. The clean lines of the drawings make for very clear images. Yeah, this ligne claire, yeah. as, they, as they refer to it in, in France. Mm. And Tintin himself is also a very androgynous character, isn't he? Yeah. He's just, yeah, he, he's just got these dots for eyes. He doesn't have much of an expression. So in a way, anyone can project themselves, girls or boys, onto him. Exactly. 
And, and then there's also this really strong narrative structure, Natiez says, particularly when Hergé started writing the books and not just the serialized comic strip. I think subconsciously, even if Hergé was probably not aware of it, the reader expects to find specific events at specific moments, and it's reassuring. For example, the way that the intrigue is resolved, you find that the same three elements in every book. First, there's a celebration of Tintin through a party, or articles in the press. Then you have the return from the trip, where the hero say, ah, how nice it is to come home. And the third element is at the very end, usually on page 62, which is traditionally the last page. You'll have a final gag, often with Captain Haddock or the Thompson twins falling over. When you take Tintin apart, you find this every time. People will say, oh, maybe this feature is in all comic books, so I've looked elsewhere to check. But I didn't find the same thing in other comics or even in Hergé's other books. So, Tintin clearly still resonates. Is there any talk of rewriting some of these problematic parts? Yeah, yeah, you're making reference to some of these books that have been rewritten. For example, Roald Dahl, right, Mm -hmm. the English version. The French publishers actually refuse to, to revise uh, certain depictions of characters and, and that kind of thing. With Tintin, probably not, um, although Tintin has had some revisions. Uh, for example, when Hergé made the color version of Tintin in the Congo in 1946, he removed some of the large animal hunting scenes mm-hmm. to placate Scandinavian publishers who were kind of horrified by the violence against animals. Yeah, but you can't really start erasing the colonial legacy, can you? Exactly. Exactly. And, you know, you're not going to redraw or maybe you mm. could, but they're not going to redraw the stereotypical depictions of, of the Congolese. Um, Natya maintains that Tintin is best appreciated if you start reading the books as a kid. And he wonders, of course, how long these books will stay popular. Kids today don't gravitate towards them by themselves. They're Mm. usually introduced by parents or grandparents. Unlike Asterix, for example, there are no new Tintin books being published each year. Hergé never wanted it. His heirs have not decided to cash in on that (laughs) for now. Though there is talk of a new book in 2052 to keep Tintin from falling into the public domain, which it would do the year after that, 70 years after Hergé's death. Anything can happen. Mm-hmm. That's it for the show. This episode was mixed by Cécile Pompeiani. Spotlight on France is a production of the English service of Radio France International. And if you have any questions or comments, then do send us an email at spotlight.france at rfi.fr. You can find us on Instagram, Spotlight on France. We'll be back in a month on Thursday, June the 1st. And why not listen to some previous episodes at rfienglish.com or wherever you get your podcasts. Bye-bye, Sarah. Bye, Alison. Bye.